You're live. I need to link. Hello. Hi, Jay. Thanks for it, joining us. So is this the link we'll be uh, streaming from? Yes, okay. I think. Great. I'm a Luddite. I really don't know anything at all. <laughs> I assume Pauline has it all under control. So it'll be like, uh, what, 30, 20, 30 minute talk? And then we discuss for 30 minute talk, maybe. Yeah. yeah this should be okay. 30. There's some uh, replay I hear in the background. I'll go get some tea in the meantime, right? Just in the next bit. Okay, we seem to be live. Yes, yes, I hear that too. And I don't know what's driving that, but maybe Pauline will work some magic. If you want to get good and I'll do a little introduction. Thanks everybody for joining. And I want to particularly point out and thank the people who have joined as members since we last held one of these. Okay, everybody, sorry for the technical difficulties there. Members, feel free to leave a message in the chat on YouTube. And before we get started with the quote program, I'd like to acknowledge the 22 new members that have subscribed to the Nature Bats Last YouTube channel since our last live stream. And in chronological order, those are, with my apologies for incorrect incorrect pronunciation. Sandra Rapash, James Gilcrest, H.M. Were many, Bell Creek, William Dillon, Advanced Advantage Play, Richard Berg, 989 Big Boss. To be the really big boss, I think you have to have 999, by the way, but maybe that's just me. Rob Cook, Diego Anthony, Holy Man, Daniel J. Lavigne, Dana Woods, Philip Stone, Langdon Stevenson, Maureen Morgan, Info Peace, Michael Gervitz, Obsolete Optics, Thomas A. Bartlett, and Claude Thomas. So thanks to each of you for joining as a member on the Nature Bats Last YouTube channel. All right, now I would like to introduce the star of the show today. I am honored to introduce the Mere Reflection Framework and the scholar who came up with the idea. The Mere Reflection Project is the brainchild of Dr. Ye Tao, a multi-talented engineer at Harvard's Roland Institute. In my well-studied opinion, this is the only project with coherent and mutually reinforcing adaptation, mitigation, and geoengineering components that has been demonstrated to have the potential to make a dent in the rapidly ongoing process of abrupt climate change. This process underlies the ongoing mass extinction event and threatens all life on earth with extinction in the near future. 
All other geoengineering projects with which I'm familiar have been found wanting after many years of scholarly investigation. For example, an article published in the June 25th, 2014 issue of the peer-reviewed journal Nature Climate Change concluded that stratospheric injection of sulfate aerosols might not work out as planned. This paper was authored by 22 distinguished scholars. The United States National Academy of Sciences issued a report on the topic on February 10th, 2015, and concluded that geoengineering is not a viable solution for the climate emergency. The European Transdisciplinary Assessment of Climate Engineering agreed in their large-scale assessment published July 16th, 2015. In the absence of some means of reversing the ongoing climate change disaster, we face a truly Hobbesian future. Unrestrained, selfish competition leading to human lives that are solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. I cannot place enough emphasis on the dire nature of our planetary predicament. Mere reflection is an adaptive mitigation project. It places the well being of ecosystems and peoples first. As such, its application acknowledges a couple of important points. First, in the initial phases, small scale implementation of mere reflection can bring local benefits immediately to the people applying the approach. At these local scales, no global impact is possible, so adaptation is the appropriate word. Put simply, initially we must adapt to the rapidly changing climate at the scale of neighborhoods and communities. After that comes mitigation, with mitigation leading to a globally coordinated approach at a large scale. In other words, global change mitigation of the rising planetary temperature comes after successful adaptation. Local implementation of the projects must, must succeed in different locations as a fundamental first step. Again, I do not believe it is possible to overstate the importance of abrupt climate change underpinning loss of habitat for our species. According to the conservative peer review literature and large scale assessments of this literature, we are driving non-human vertebrates and non-human mammals to extinction at rates unprecedented during our time on earth. As vertebrate mammals, we too fit into the category of severely endangered. If humans are to persist beyond the next few years, we must take radical action focused on preservation of habitat for homo sapiens. This action cannot wait. So far, serious proposals to address this matter have been delayed by the absence of understanding of the importance of abrupt climate change, the attendant lack of funding, and creative approaches rooted in evidence. I think you will agree that Dr. Tao and the Mere Reflection Framework offer a path forward. I encourage you to watch and listen with an open mind as if our future as a species depends upon it. Dr. Tao, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Guy, uh, for the invitation and Pauline for coordinating everything. Pauline, could you please uh, enable screen sharing so that I can show some slides? So uh, I think uh, Guy and I share a passion for uh, teaching and uh, I myself am a student of Guy having learned the urgency of the, the crisis uh, from many of his uh, videos that he had posted for like more than 10 years. Uh, so, and today I'm actually taking a uh, somewhat of a, of a pedagogical angle and uh, I'm trying to uh, learn how to teach complex uh, concepts more uh, easily to the public. So you guys are listening are my guinea pigs. I haven't uh, shown many of the slides I'll be sharing today. And so the goal today is to really learn how uh, the universe functions. And uh, when you have uh, the core uh, principle under your belt, it will be very easy to analyze uh, the many, the myriads of uh, solutions that are being proposed. And today I will later on uh, describe uh, just how like a couple of the most, um, uh, you know, dominant and the famous ones, including planting trees, for example, are not solutions at all. So um, let me share slides. So uh, before I begin, I'd like to also acknowledge the, the land that I'm on and the Native Americans that occupied it for uh, many thousands of years before they were uh, taken away from them. And uh, I wish that uh, uh, my crew, the art uh, replication of uh, the wampum uh, can be taken as a tribute uh, to the land and their philosophy for life. And uh, we hope that uh, mirrors can one day be the binding agent that the United Nations and the peoples in our common fight for survival. So 
there are many learning goals for today, today but let's start by uh, understanding how the universe works in a very simplified but very central dynamical picture. And once we understand that, it will be very easy to see why meeting the Paris Agreement targets are physically impossible at this moment. And then we'll give uh, examples of why, for example, direct air capture is a profitable uh, venture, but it's not scalable to anywhere near what's necessary. And uh, reforestation and afforestations are only distractions that uh, is preventing more suitable or more effective projects from being uh, pursued. And um, they have turned into uh, a method or a tool for corporations to keep doing uh, the pollution that has been uh, uh, doing to our environment uh, through a greenwashing. So we need to be aware of that. And then we will uh, discuss near reflection, but today due to time constraints, we won't go into details. There's uh, several talks that's already on YouTube that you can refer to, but we'll uh, draw some interesting uh, parallels between uh, the effectiveness of mirrors compared to many other solutions. So in the universe, we have different uh, states of matter and they evolve under the influence of energy. They can move around and transform into different chemical compositions and different crystals or different liquids or gases. And the way they do that is following physical laws of nature. And in the human system, um, how we move things around, how we uh, create different objects are also a consequence of our technology and also how we as a society decide to do things in a certain way, one way or another. So these are the things that dictates how matter and energy are interconverted. Many forms of matter can be conceptualized as going undergoing flux. So uh, the end in that uh, rectangle symbolizes just a state of matter. We call that a node. For example, um, say water in your bathtub. So RS is the source rate. It's basically the rate at which you add water to your bathtub. And RC, RK is the sink rate. Uh, if you uh, pull the plug, then water will start to flow out. So uh, the way to measure these uh, flux rates are in units of so some quantity divided by time. So in the case of water, it could be the number of water molecules per second that flows through um, your tap and going, going down the drain, for example. So it's very important to note that there is a unit of inverse time in describing the flux rates R. So as a, one example, uh, here is a funnel, water going in and water, water coming out. And at this particular moment, we have uh, just incidentally the source rate and sink rate being equal. And when that's the case, there is a net of no change of the amount of water in the funnel as a function of time. So the level indicated by the uh, purple arrow is stable in time. However, let's say we turn on uh, the source, open the, uh, the faucet more, then water comes down faster. And in that case, the source rate is larger than the sink rate. And what happens is that over time, the funnel starts to overflow. We can also have the inverse situation of instability when let's say we change to a funnel that has a larger sink rate, a larger opening, then in that case, the amount of stuff in that node will be a decreasing function of time. Eventually in this case, it's completely depleted. So if we want to keep something stable, something perpetual or uh, something that will last, we need to make sure that we put in stuff and take out stuff at the same rate. So it's a very simple principle. Uh, of course, at the same time that there is a, a flux of matter through any node, there's always some flux of energy as well. And in this particular case, one example is the potential energy of water in the, in the, in the funnel. There's also a, a constant flux of energy. Um, and the, the units are similar for uh, the energy and the matter in that they both carry the inverse time. So in this uh, case, for example, uh, second to the minus one unit. And uh, there's uh, for energy often um, units of the length 
inverse, basically uh, the density over some uh, cross-sectional area. But that's a detail that's usually not very important. You will see example of that later. So we have the another important principle that uh, energy flux usually accompanies matter flux. And uh, of course, the other one, if we want to make sure things are stable in time, we need to make sure that both the flux of matter and the flux of energy are balanced at the source and at the same. All right, so let's see how we can apply that to understand uh, climate change. Um, back in time, before we started to burn coal, let's say, at, uh, in this case, reference time zero, um, energy, rad radiant energy was coming into Earth at the same rate as it was going out, RK. So the difference between the source, Rs minus Rk is zero. That's uh, indicated by this uh, red line uh, aligned to zero. So there's no change in time. Let's say somehow we turn down the rate of the sink. So decreasing the size of arrow, that will lead to a situation where the difference between source and sink now is not zero anymore, but some positive value. So people have asked the question for the whole Earth system, what happens if we suddenly impose a step function heating power on Earth of some magnitude? Uh, James Hansen and a colleague, Dr. Saito, recently uh, posted a blog, and this graph has actually been communicated in multiple com uh, publications. It's basically uh, the response of the Earth system in temperature units. So this is vertical temperature, uh, axis is temperature, as a result of such a sudden step uh, uh, function of a heating driving force. We see that the response is rather complicated, but it more or less can be understood as uh, composed of two regimes or a, slow, a fast regime where uh, the temperature response goes to roughly half of the total response uh, within one decade, sometimes 40% in five years, roughly. And the long time scale regime uh, of how the Earth would be after, say, uh, thousands of years. So uh, we have, well, climate scientists have invented names for those uh, uh, two numbers. So um, the short response is called uh, the transient climate response. And right now, the best estimate for this um, number is about two degrees per doubling of CO2. So doubling of CO2 co corresponds to 3.7 watt per meter squared in terms of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the radiative forcing. Um, but what the, the important thing to note is that in on Earth at this moment, uh, the difference between the source rate and sink rate is some number that's roughly one watt per meter squared. So this number is known fairly uh, precisely to say 10%. So the implication of the fact that currently there is uh, some unrealized heating power and that we know uh, the dependence of temperature response uh, as a function of such heating power leads us to conclude that uh, on the time scale of decades to maybe a century, we should expect 0 0.5 cent, uh, degrees Celsius of warming. And to obtain this number, you simply take 0 0.9 watt per meter squared, multiplied by this two degrees Celsius per 3.7 watt per meter squared. So uh, if we compare 0.9 and 3.7, that's roughly a quarter. So a quarter of roughly two is a half a degree. So that's where that number comes from. Uh, but of course, we also know that after the short-term fast response, the Earth will continue to, to heat, but at a slower rate, and eventually um, will reach uh, you know, a higher temperature. Um, and so the number corresponding to that is equilibrium climate sensitivity. And the best estimate is about 3.5 plus minus one degree Celsius for the same uh, doubling of CO2 equivalent of forcing. So again, take that number multiplied by 0.9, we know that we're looking at another degree more of heating. And everybody watching this uh, channel should be aware that we have 
realized at least 1.3 degrees Celsius based on some more recent baseline that we're looking at in the long term, at least 2.3 degrees Celsius of total warming. And the first viewers of this web, uh, of this, uh, this channel, we know that that's not taking into account uh, the amount of heating that's hidden by the aerosols, which is according to the most recent estimates, uh, about 1.2 watt per meter squared. So the actual amount of heating that we should can expect if we were to uh, ramp down fossil uh, fuel combustion without compensatory measures, thereby uh, losing the cooling effect of aerosols is on the order of one degree Celsius. And that will happen very quickly as a result of the fast response function we just uh, discussed before. And that will happen within one decade. And on longer time scales, we're looking at more than two degrees Celsius. So um, in my previous uh, talks online, we explained why even 1.5 to two degrees Celsius is too much for ecosystems to, to really um, uh, tolerate on um, a perpetual long-term basis. So we certainly do not want to uh, go anywhere near three degrees Celsius of heating. So summary of this discussion is that uh, Paris Agreement is calling for ideally 1.5 degrees Celsius warm, not more than that, and well below two degrees. But it's simply not possible anymore at this moment uh, without some drastic uh, engineering intervention. And uh, the other aims of the agreement to improve uh, our resilience to climate change, adapting to it, and also trying to mitigate uh, the situation by reducing greenhouse gases are still possible, but they're very uh, difficult. And we'll uh, hopefully uh, have a discussion on that later after the presentation. So what can we do? Well, today I decided to uh, rather discuss what not to do, because that's exactly what the mainstream um, climate mitigation field uh, and all the funding is going to. And we need, really need to pointed out that it's a fundamentally a flawed approaches. So the techniques we'll be discussing today include direct air capture of CO2 and uh, efforts and calls to reforest and to plant a, a forest in places where historically no forests at all. So the proposal uh, to uh, capture CO2 from the air, uh, I will discuss why it's a uh, essentially not feasible. So what we have done, let's say from the moment uh, atmospheric CO2 was at the, the maximum tolerable 350 ppm, um, after we have continued to emit uh, pollution, we have now increased the total CO2 loading to 440 ppm. So in the mixing process, we have actually given up some energy. We have wasted, thrown away energy uh, in the amount of about 300 exajoules, or um, roughly three times 10 to the 20 joules. I will uh, come back to uh, understanding why that's the case a bit later. But if, if we want to reverse the, pro uh, the mixing process going in, in reverse by what's called direct air capture, the amount of energy we need to input to overcome that energy is actually much larger. And it will be right now that, uh, based on uh, what's uh, technically feasible about 6,000 exajoules. So how do we understand that? Well, it's uh, basically entropy, uh, second law of thermodynamics. So imagine that we had, instead of air and the CO2 exhaust, we had salt and pepper. If you want to mix the two, it's very easy. It doesn't take much effort, you just pour them together in the mix them in two seconds, you have a well-mixed state. But imagine having to separate mixed salt and the pepper. That's a much, much more laborious uh, process because putting order back into something that's disorder, uh, a system that's disordered is simply very difficult and energy expensive. And that's basically the reason why undoing uh, the, uh, our, you know, throwing away energy of uh, uh, free energy of mixing by direct air capture is very energetically costly. 
So for comparison, the energy spent by the US military in a year is one exajoule roughly. So which means if the world were to devote an operation the size of the US military to do direct air capture, it will take us 6,000 years to return atmospheric CO2 back to 350 ppm level. That's obviously a difficult challenge to say the least. Even if we were to use the entire world's military to do that operation, it will still take two to 3,000 years because the US is roughly a third of the world's military. And recently, uh, some uh, very smart colleagues pointed at the, out this flaw in a uh, peer-reviewed publication, Nature Communications. So they analyzed two of the most uh, commonly invoked direct air capture processes. One, for example, requires uh, making a lot of sodium hydroxide as the capturing agent. The other involves making uh, uh, ethyl hydroxyl um, meth. Let's see, what's MEA? Ethanol amine as the uh, CO2 capturing agent. And uh, they found that to make enough, say, the sodium hydroxide uh, to capture our you know, roughly one year of em emissions, we need to ramp up the production by roughly uh, 100 times. And the same thing goes for making the capturing agent in the other route. It's also uh, actually in this case, more than two orders of magnitude, uh, more than what we can produce uh, every year just to make the capturing material. If we look at the uh, energy required to produce uh, these uh, just one uh, component in that process uh, for both methods, they are comparable to the total energy consumption by the entire world, which is roughly 18.5 terawatts. And even if we can make the infrastructure, the material, just you know, one component to run the process, one of the steps in this process to keep it running requires roughly one half of the total global consumption in energy. So it doesn't seem uh, to make very much a lot of sense to devote essentially all the world's energy consumption and the material production capability and more than our material production capability to uh, you know, capture CO2 that we would emit in making these uh, uh, agents and run these processes anyways. So obviously these processes can be successful at small scale. They work in the lab on small scale, but when policymakers fail to understand the, the physics and energy limitations and or fail to understand numbers, the technology becomes a loophole that uh, companies can exploit for short-termistic profits, but without any possibility for achieving the claim and marketed the purpose of sequestering carbon dioxide at level that's even close to what's necessary to make a dent on the situation. So we must, as you know, uh, the world, the humanity, a society, whatever, stop all funding to direct air capture technologies, at least the existing reported technologies, because they are essentially scams, to be honest. All right, so technology will not save us. So nature-based solution will, no? So let's uh, spend the next uh, few minutes discussing that. Since we started agriculture, we have converted roughly 40% of uh, our land to grow food for ourselves and for the animals that we eat. What reforestation refers to is to uh, essentially give up uh, agriculture and let forests grow back to where they were found historically. And afforestation is somewhat different. It uh, aims to plant forests uh, in areas where historically uh, there were no forests, for example, non-forest biomes. Uh, Guy is a ecologist and he would point out that uh, non-forest biomes are also biologically diverse and they merit protection and they're equally worth protecting. The obvious problem with the reforestation is that we will 
uh, start, you know, induce, accelerate global starvation. And uh, it's no mystery who will be the people who will be penalized first. What about afforestation? Well, as I pointed out, and Guy would agree, it's going to be an ecological disaster. So we shouldn't, you know, hope that nature will save us. Actually, we need to save the agents of nature-based solutions. And what are those agents? First of all, the trees. We need to save trees. They are not able to save us at this point. And also the activists, uh, sorry for the spelling here, um, promoting these solutions, um, I think they have fallen victim to greenwashing misinformation campaign by companies who want to use this as a credit to continue their fossil fuel emissions. So it's as dangerous as the narrative of climate denial that we have been presented with uh, in, in the years before. We will analyze nature-based solutions from uh, habitat feasibility, uh, some impact on biodiversity data, and also more quantitatively from its cost, the impact and the scale and the speed they can deliver. So we're in the midst of uh, climate change, likely irreversible. And we can project that in the coming decades, there will be less and less habitat for trees. And trees will suffer as a result of both increasing temperature and the resulting uh, drought because temperature drives evaporation and that's deprive them of water faster. So we can project that it will be harder and harder to grow. And we have very good empirical data showing that even two or three degrees Celsius increase in temperature can reduce the carbon density or tree density, if you will, per area by on the order of 30, 40%. So that's very dramatic decrease in the capacity for trees to store carbon or to grow. And people have uh, done a fairly comprehensive analysis uh, in many sites in China, comparing the biodiversity of consumers like birds and other animals uh, on, in crop ecosystems, native forest against the monoculture of, uh, uh, that's resulting from afforestation and also uh, more engineered mixed species uh, forests. And it's quite striking to find that croplands is actually better for uh, biodiversity than just planted forests. Now let's uh, discuss why um, as a strategy, making forests has very little or very limited uh, climate benefit. To understand that, we have to uh, understand this uh, somewhat com more complicated diagram, but now because we had the lesson about how nodes work and how um, they grow in time or shrinking time as a function of the ratio or the difference between the sink and source rate, we should be able to understand it. So we know that what we need is to cool down the earth. So the real enemy, number one, is the heat stored in Earth's biosphere. And we can decrease that node either by increasing the sink rate by opening the outlet or by uh, reducing the source rate. So those are our possibilities uh, if acting on that node directly. So that's a, those are direct knobs, faster direct knobs. If we want instead to pursue conventional mitigation and look at greenhouse gases, then we're operating at one step removed. And people usually have been trying to uh, demand a decrease in CO2 concentrations, which would then indirectly open up uh, the rate of uh, heat escaping. So that's an indirect growth. Now let's like, look at trees. What do they do? So trees essentially are slightly increasing the sink rate of CO2 from the atmosphere by absorbing it. And uh, hopefully through uh, uptake by growth, but that's a question mark because we know they are becoming less and less capable of growing due to heat and drop stress. But let's say for a second, they, they will continue to be able to do that. Then the indirect effect on the heat node is that the sink rate will open up. However, what about the indirect effect on the source rate? 
actually it turns out it would also go up. Why is it? Well, I took this picture when I was making that uh, um, art piece, Wong Pong. I put a shell of different colors and also mirrors on the ice, on the snow actually, and uh, watched how much uh, the different structures sunk after one day of exposure to the sunlight. We see that the darker muscle shells really melted away much more uh, ice compared to the lighter clam shell and the mirrors essentially hasn't changed. That's just because the darker object was absorbing more heat and that heat that's transmitted to melting the ice. And the forests are much darker than the surrounding uh, soil or desert, for example. And the trees, especially when they mature, will become darker on average. And that's why growing trees will also increase the heat uptake from the sunlight into the ground. So the overall climate benefit, as I will show more quantitative later, is actually very small for planting trees. And the mirrors, um, well, obviously, they are blocking uh, the source rate. So that would be a very significant decrease. And there's very little uh, effect on sink rate, where so in some cases, we can engineer it to also increase the sink rate. And overall effect is that we have a strong cooling, because that's in accordance of what we need to be doing in order to decrease heat trapped in Earth's biosphere. And uh, also, when we cool the land, we also provide a better habitat for trees. So there is actually a positive effect for nature-based solutions through implementing mirrors. So here are just some uh, uh, data sets showing how the albedo of the pine and the spruce both decrease. Basically, they become darker as they age. And the, the, uh, the range of the change is on the order of 0.1 for the various trees um, that's grown. Now, let's uh, uh, compare uh, an interesting thought experiment. So all the trees in, uh, in Asia, because you know, they, they are absorbing uh, some uh, heat, they have an effective heating effect on the planet. And uh, the amount of uh, uh, force, local radiative forcing when a tree is found in East Asia is about um, you know, 15 to 20 watt per meter squared. If say that carbon, that biomass all went into CO2, uh, the result is actually not too different. So basically the tiny decrease in heating by absorbing CO2 into trees in Asia is very small on the order of maybe a couple watt per meter squared. In the US, we have a, a bit more of a difference um, um, because uh, the trees are generally um, forest on average are older and also, um, so they uh, contain a bit more carbon, for example, and also the um, um, latitude is more favorable for capturing uh, more carbon in the trees. And the, uh, where it really could be useful are in the tropics, but in Amazon, because uh, over there, uh, the aerial carbon content is much uh, bigger in lush Amazonian forests. But even in the Amazon, uh, the, uh, the cooling effect for the, uh, for the forest is only about, on average, maybe 20 watt per meter squared. And we'll uh, discuss later how a mirror can deliver three to five times higher efficiency compared to forest. What about cost for forest? Various estimates uh, put the cost for sequestering one ton to anywhere between maybe 20, 30 to upwards of a thousand. And if we want to assume for a second that it was uh, scalable, then we're looking at the several trillion dollar USD uh, of investment to use nature-based solutions. And that's essentially in the same ballpark as the entire world's GDP. But the problem is that forest solutions may not be scalable and here uh, on this slide is what we're discussing. We have to remember that our annual emissions is on the order of uh, 
50 gigaton CO2 equivalent. And in terms of carbon equivalent, that's roughly 14 gigaton carbon. So Guy, do you want to take a guess as to um, how many gigaton of, of carbon are uh, contained in all the forest in East Asia? Sorry, I wouldn't even have a clue. Okay, so I don't blame you. People that don't really talk about these things when they uh, propose solutions. So the entire forest in Asia has a biomass of nine gigaton of carbon, which is uh, basically what the world emits in eight months. And in the US and Alaska, it's a little bit better because of, uh, you know, it's a relatively uh, a larger piece of land and also it has a shorter history of being uh, subjected to agriculture and also less um, desertification on average. But still, it's the order of a few years of um, global emissions. Uh, many people, people are promoting uh, forestation as a way to sequester carbon, not only in the biomass, but also in soil. But experimental evidence are at odds with these claims. Um, so in the past few decades, China has undertaken the most aggressive afforestation campaigns and they found essentially you have both soil carbon loss and the soil carbon gain depending on uh, various uh, local conditions. And on average, the total gain in soil over the last 30 years was only 0 0.2 gigaton carbon, which equates to six hours of global annual emissions. So that doesn't seem to be a very a uh, good investment of uh, resources. So what is the global, you know, we discussed the uh, Asia and America, but globally, what's the total potential for carbon sequestration through reforestation? This question has been uh, exhaustive, exhaustively examined uh, in recent publications. And the number is 40 gigaton carbon. And of course it takes many, many uh, years to uh, reach the full potential. So it's a very slow process. Um, and uh, that's assuming, of course, no climate change. But in the case of climate change, we know that either the 40 gigaton will be slashed by half, or maybe at least a third, due to the mechanism of heating and drop we discussed, or it will take us much longer time. But in general, that's the type of uh, like time scale we, we can expect, just decades to centuries. And because we're emitting at such high rates, you know, 14, uh, we mentioned before, gigaton carbon per year, all of that forest growth will be gone in just two years of uh, our uh, global emissions. So it doesn't seem to be a sustainable uh, solution to sequestering our CO2 emissions. So the conclusion from this analysis, unequivocally, I hope, is that Afforestation and the reforestation have been exploited as opportunities by different companies to uh, greenwash their agenda, their product, their service. And there's a related issue of bioenergy uh, that I like to point you to this uh, channel on Just Everything that's, uh, that came out three or four days ago. But the main takeaway is that we shouldn't be trading our natural resources for carbon credits. What we really need to do is we just need to decarbonize, take the hard route, and do not give the companies, you know, these uh, carbon credit. That's basically inventions. Um, and we must stop funding afforestation, afforestation specifically. Uh, despite, I'm sure, the good intentions of many people engaged in these activities, they are simply not consistent with what we know scientifically. All right, so um, in the remaining time, I would like to um, draw your attention to a few equivalences um, that illustrate the uh, effectiveness of the mirrors compared to other um, approaches. So first, we can liken a mirror installed on Earth as a air conditioning system for the whole planet uh, in the same way that you have uh, air conditioners for your house. And let's analyze the uh, efficiency of these two devices for the two systems. To run your AC, you, have, you need uh, constant access to electricity, let's say consumed at the power of Q. 
And for a typical coefficient of performance of three, that's you know, generally the case, you can expect the energy removal rate from your inside the house to the outside at a rate of three Q. And the energy input to the mirror is a little different. It's like one-time investment, like say, some number, say Q prime. But the coefficient of performance for the mirror we did the calculation is a function of time where T is how long you leave it. It, it basically functions whenever there is sunlight. And uh, for a typical uh, lifetime of 30 years, that's the engineering design mirrors, we can expect uh, an amount of energy that's greater than 3000 Q removed. Uh, what about for the, uh, the AC? There's also the emission of CO2, right? Not only the, the removal of uh, heat into the environment, there's also emission of CO2 gas. And that will induce 50 Q of thermal energy being trapped inside um, the Earth's uh, biosphere. So if we're, we're willing you know, to invest resources, energy to cool our house, what shouldn't we invest in something that's much better for the, the globe, making it also less necessary in many parts of the world to turn on the AC? So now let's come back to uh, equating the climate benefits uh, in this is actually only the carbon sequestration benefits of mirror versus forest. Each meter squared of mirror is roughly equal to three meters squared of uh, tropical forest in terms of uh, carbon sequestration or carbon negative effect cancellation uh, potential. And uh, that's including both above ground biomass and below ground biomass for both uh, Africa and the Amazon. In Asia's forest, the number is better for the mirror because those forests uh, sequester are uh, less biomass per uh, unit of area. And those are for mature, uh, uh, native forests. For planted monocultures and planted uh, uh, commercial forests, the difference is even, is even larger. It's uh, 10 times better, at least. And in terms of uh, cooling benefits, the gap is bigger. So mere per meter squared basis is roughly five to 50 times better than forest. What about uh, ice? So to answer that question, we need to uh, like specifically Arctic ice. We need to understand how much energy is impinging on Arctic ice. And uh, uh, this recent paper uh, compiled uh, data from the past you know, century or so and concluded that uh, there's roughly, you know, on average 70 uh, watt per meter squared of energy impinging on the Arctic. And let's assume that Arctic ice has reflect 70% of the light. That means uh, roughly 40, 50, you know, watt per meter squared of energy are being rejected by Arctic ice. But we know that one meter squared of mirror can do, you know, between 100 and sometimes 200 watt per meter squared. So that's roughly uh, two to three times as efficient as ice in the Arctic. So not only are mirrors super forests, they're also super Arctic ice from a climate benefit point of view. So many people have uh, proposed to refreeze the Arctic for example, by uh, performing marine cloud brightening. I think this proposal does not really take into account how heat is transported to the Arctic. This plot shows the heat transport by either ocean current in gray or by air current uh, in black. And uh, the negative arises from the definition in this particular paper of uh, northward heat transport. So when you have a negative northward heat transport in the southern hemisphere, it means the heat is flowing to the South Pole. And let's compare this uh, circulation transport of heat with uh, the absorption, uh, local absorption by shortwave uh, conversion to heat. The area of Arctic Ocean is a 14 trillion meters squared. And at the average, uh, 
horizontal global irradiance of 70 watt per meter squared and, uh, and say blue ocean events of uh, 0.95 uh, absorptivity, the maximum uh, heat generation by shortwave absorption is only 0.8 petawatt. So that's uh, very low compared to the scale of this chart, which plots heat transport by atmospheric circulation. And uh, marine cloud brightening can probably uh, improve albedo over the ocean by 10, 20%. So that's roughly 0.1 petawatt. So plotted on this graph, even if we were to see the entire Arct Arctic Ocean by marine cloud, we make a very tiny little dent on the total heat imbalance that's pouring into the Arctic because the trop tropical uh, latitudes are absorbing so much more heat. And we know that this whole world, the heat transport is worse in the winter than the summer. Why is that? We know that heat transport, uh, heat uh, conduction increases as a function of the difference in temperature between the heat source and heat sink. And in the winter, there's more of a heat difference between the poles and uh, the equatorial regions. That's why uh, when we cool the pole, we actually favor, we, we would amplify this poleward heat transport. So local cooling over the Arctic is not in principle a viable strategy to go about cooling the Arctic. So with that, I'd like to finish today because um, that has been a really long uh, presentation already. I'd like to uh, thank uh, members of the Mirror Reflection Projects, all the scientists who did the, uh, the work in many of the studies I cited today, and also uh, truth seekers, including uh, Professor McPherson, and uh, all the people who have advised um, and helped with the project, and also my colleagues at the Roland Institute uh, for helpful discussions, and for uh, the founder of Roland, Dr. Edward H. Land, for his vision uh, to uh, form this institute and giving uh, young scientists like myself the uh, uh, freedom to pursue subjects that we deem important. Thank you very much, Dr. Tao, for that presentation. And everybody can rest assured that it will be archived on YouTube automatically shortly after we are done here, probably within an hour after we wrap this up. Now, with the, oh, say, 10 or 15 minutes we have remaining, let's open it up to questions to Dr. Tao about the information he just presented. So if you're on YouTube chatting away, please fire away with questions. Maya has a question for you, Dr. Tao. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if Dr. Tao has applied for Bezos's climate change pledge. Uh, we have not uh, applied to that particular um, uh, fund. So, um, so there are many of these uh, uh, opportunities that are opening up. And uh, we have so far, for example, tried to apply to Earthshot Prize through Cornell University. And that has been uh, unsuccessful for reasons that uh, we don't uh, quite uh, understand. I mean, we're not part of the Cornell, so it's understandable that the university would want to uh, you know, prioritize projects perhaps uh, coming from that region and that university. Uh, we did have uh, about two or three colleagues uh, who are at Cornell and elsewhere writing letters of recommendations, strongly supporting nomination, but uh, uh, still wasn't uh, successful. I think the mainstream uh, mitigation engineering field have not really caught up 
with uh, have not made a connection between ecology and the climate change and the urgency. And they also have not really understood the aerosol masking uh, effects. So uh, the mainstream paradigm is still that re renewable energy research is the key. So there's um, this lag in uh, the mainstream understanding. And, uh, and that reflects in our uh, relative uh, you know, lack of success in such endeavors. Right. Yeah. So Raymond asks, how long would mere construction and deployment take? And you and I have talked about this a little bit at the various scales, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, the construction of the mirrors, if we want to say, just produce at a rate that would uh, keep current conditions, we need to ramp up uh, global glass production by a factor of roughly 10 times. So it will be a, an effort, coordinated effort, but it's uh, something that's totally within um, uh, our capabilities. And uh, the, uh, the making of such mirrors, uh, there are many different ways to go about it. Even using existing technology, uh, it's uh, still possible. I mean, it's uh, the the key thing is to how to figure out coding on many many mirrors simultaneously. Um, and uh, coming from my field of uh, instrumentation and the fabrication technologies, we have several ideas on how to do these, uh, uh, how to do the mirror coding very quickly on glass. And I we did the calculations that suggest it's uh, entirely uh, feasible. To, to ramp up. But the R&D required to develop the, uh, the specialized chambers and machinery to do this coding, which require in optimal cases, two years, two to three years of intensive R&D. That's assuming that uh, the project could be funded at the level of uh, 100 million US dollars for three years of focused R&D. Um, so the have... difference between uh, white paint and the mirrors are multiple, white paint, uh, first of all, they reflect light in every which direction. So uh, light photons, they are of different use to humans when, when they travel in different energy uh, in directions. When they are collimated, it's very easy to use mirrors to direct them to a specific location for alternative use. So when that's the case, you can cons consider mirrors as a wires for photon energy, just like uh, uh, copper wires are a conductor that guides uh, the travel of the electrical energy. And white paint, unfortunately, scatters uh, light in every which uh, direction. So you only achieve uh, one function of local cooling uh, and lose the ability to optimize the direction of exit through the atmosphere to achieve maximal energy um, rejection. Because when, say, the light is traveling parallel to ground, eventually will hit the next building and get absorbed, right? And the white the roof does exactly that. And also uh, white uh, paint, depending on the composition, many have uh, binders that are based on petroleum products. So they will oxidize over uh, time as well and release uh, carbon dioxide. And so it's, um, it's not the most optimal use uh, of a petroleum resource. And also there's a very limited roof space to have um, uh, sufficient impact for the duration that we need to bridge ourselves over uh, until we finalize the uh, civilization transformation. I don't know the answer to this question. I'm not sure you will either. Joanne says, would permission have to be given from any country slash entity in order to place the mirrors? Um, sorry, I got distracted by the, the power plant question. Okay, could you please repeat? Fire away with Fire, go ahead. Oh, the, uh, somebody asked uh, whether placing mirrors over um, um, power plant cooling water source, a nuclear power plant cooling water source. Uh, so the problem with uh, uh, nuclear power plants is that the heat is generated uh, from the inside, not uh, from a power source that's uh, outside, as is the sun in this case for Earth's uh, heating. So mirrors uh, would not really help in that particular case. Oh, okay, so next question, how much surface area would be needed to forestall our demise, at least temporarily? So <clears throat> the surface area will be uh, pretty uh, big on this. So if we want to keep 
current conditions more or less constant, we need to uh, uh, install globally an area of Kansas per year. Uh, and that's for on the order of a decade uh, while we do this uh, you know, aggressive transition to renewables. So we have to you know, be, be ready to use some land for this purpose. Um, luckily, um, we think it's possible to choose locations that are already under extreme uh, drought and heat stress that uh, agriculture is becoming impossible. And we have reason, strong reasons to believe that installing mirrors in those areas that are, that are des desertifying will enable those are areas to uh, keep their agricultural production under some levels of uh, uh, self-sufficiency and sustenance. Um, where on the globe is most efficient place to put the mirrors? Um, so the, let me just pull up the one slide to answer that question. So Jagger Alexander on our team uh, did that uh, assessment of the uh, efficiency of cooling as a function of location and is plotted here. And the color bar uh, ranges from you know, uh, zero to 150 watt per meter squared of local cooling potential. You see that uh, uh, many parts of the world are compatible with uh, this uh, technique, at least uh, at level of above 100 watt per meter squared of, uh, of cooling. And the trick is that um, we can choose to tilt the mirrors to an angle that's um, more or less aligned to the, uh, you know, the direction uh, of how high the sun rises uh, over the horizon. You know, and uh, those are average results for a year. Um, but in general, large parts of uh, Western United States, uh, uh, Australia, uh, Mongolia, Tibet, um, a large part of the Middle East are pretty good locations and they achieve more or less you know, comparable efficiency to within 50%. Will you comment briefly on the difference between implementing the mirrors on the ocean as opposed to on, on terrestrial surfaces? Um, so if we want, it's obviously technically much more challenging to implement them on the ocean. Um, the advantage is that they wouldn't uh, be uh, competing with the existing land use. But of course that's assuming that the mirrors are not enhancing current land use, which we have strong reasons to believe that they would. Uh, and so uh, there's also strong reasons to slowly move agriculture and food, food production to the oceans. And the uh, floating mirror arrays could be designed as part of the floating agriculture, mariculture in infrastructure. And it's always good to have access to more corners and locations on the globe to perform this uh, cooling. Because uh, once we scale to such a scale to have a global impact, it would really matter where you place them. Because uh, each location, you know, it's like an impulse. It, it will reverberate, have some reverberation or response over the globe that has its own particular pattern. So the response, the global response pattern to a particular location of implementation um, is called uh, uh, remotely. That's remote from where it's implemented is a, a teleconnection. It's a term used in the field uh, in this field. So if we can have access to all possible locations, then we can fine tune the, uh, the sum of the different responses to such a state that's, that's overall uh, positive for everybody involved, for all the stakeholders, which are all the 8 billion humans on this earth. So we don't want to leave anybody behind. So having the ability to you know, have access to the full um, like basis uh, set, if you will, if you you know to still remember uh, linear algebra, then it's good to have um, the maximal flexibility in tuning the response. Okay, somebody wants to know about hurricanes, typhoons, typhoons ruining ocean installed systems, and you and I have talked about it. Maybe you can give an overview. Yeah. So. Um, Hurricane and typhoons will certainly create a lot of waves action that will be very detrimental to fragile floating systems. So the, the way around that is to 
designed uh, the mirrors a floating array to be able to sink to a certain control the depth. So if you sunk to say 100 feet depth in the middle of a hurricane, uh, the water down there will be pretty calm. So uh, the difficulty, the major difficulty in uh, implementing ocean system is exactly designing the infrastructure that can achieve that sort of uh, sinking, floating uh, capability. Uh, but uh, we are not you know, dependent on making that work because land-based uh, mirrors in the initial and even in the uh, mitigation phase, there's enough land and also flexibility on land to tune the response in our opinion. And also while providing local uh, temperature reduction and water saving for agriculture. Okay, just 75 more questions and then let's wrap this up in the next five minutes. What about space-based mirrors or space-based particles? Sometimes is, this is the idea that I think started with Roger Angel when he was a professor at the University of Arizona, maybe he still is. I think there's a, even maybe a older proposals, but uh, he uh, was one that wrote one of the more authoritative initial uh, texts on this uh, topic. Uh, I think the major uh, problem with the space space mirrors include uh, we don't have the technology to make uh, the such ultra thin mirror, but that are still stable, uh, that are proposed, um, uh, that are described in such proposals, and also the launching cost for delivering such infrastructure into space at the scope required is not a solved uh, uh, problem, and the fuel consumption and uh, the number of rockets required is not currently within the reach. And uh, once they are there, we do not have a uh, uh, you know, number. Uh, so in these calculations, people generally assume the entire structure is only the, the mirrors, which they assume to be like five to 10 micron thin films, basically something that's uh, you know, one tenth to tw one twentieth the thickness of your hair. So they're assuming something ridiculously thin. First of all, I don't know, as a, I, I work in nanoscience, I don't know how such a film would be mechanically stable. There is no no material with uh, the stability uh, to withstand. <laughs> yeah, there's maybe some that come close to maybe 100 microns for the area that's required. So right. technically we don't have the te technology. And uh, right. long I think the bottom line is we know how to make mirrors and they're relatively inexpensive based on materials that are readily available here but doing anything is we've demonstrated time and time again that we're not really adept at doing anything in space. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's that's one thing. The other is you, we only gain a factor of maybe five to 10 by placing, doing all that trouble to lift the mirror into space. Right. And, uh, yeah. Somebody asked how long would environmental impact studies take? And typically they would take more time than I suspect we have. But in addition, when it comes to things like mm, world wars and potential loss of habitat for our species, I think that federal governments might find some workaround with respect to environmental impact studies. And similarly, what happens to the wildlife slash plant life in an area designated as a place for mirrors, that's something that would have to be taken very seriously, obviously. And we would want to focus on areas that have already served as ecological or environmental sacrifice zones. And there are plenty of those out there. Yes. Gary, Indiana comes to mind. Yeah, and we, we really are pushing for implementing in the crop fields because they are already highly engineered uh, land that we basically grab from nature. So there, there's little argument for protecting uh, already highly engineered cropland. And uh, we have uh, preliminary uh, reasons to believe that there will be water saving and the yield increase um, advantages in having mirrors interspersed, especially when uh, future heat waves are becoming more and more um, uh, urgent and severe. You know that every day spent beyond 30 degrees Celsius would lead to one to two percent decrease in crop yield. So if we can reduce, uh, you know, the average temperature by even a fraction of a degree, we can potentially avert, um, you know, countrywide crop failures. So I think there's, uh, as far as we can see, only an advantage uh, if we only consider uh, crop 
an agricultural field in first pass. And there are certainly enough land, cropland on earth to call us back to even like ice age because we have you know, used 40% of land. And if you imagine, we mentioned how Amir is at least three times more efficient than Amazon forest uh, at uh, sequestering carbon and five times at least more efficient at cooling. It's not surprising that when we have taken 40% of uh, earth land for agriculture, we have more than enough land to, uh, to keep us cool. Right. Right. Well, one final question, and then I'd like to wrap. Oh, by the way, everybody who's watching, listening, Dr. Tao has a much longer version of a presentation that goes into more detail, and we're going to work to get that out within the next week or two. We record it and get it out. Maybe I'm speaking out of turn here because I'm speaking on Pauline's behalf, since she's the one who will be the, doing the recording and the editing. One final question, wouldn't, and I don't know the answer to this, wouldn't placing the mirrors in mid-latitudes have the unintended consequence of further weakening the jet stream? Um, that would be uh, one concern because yes, then you would be decreasing the, the temperature gradient between the two, uh, two zones. Um, but the problem is there's, if there's a better way, then we should consider it. Uh, but in the absence of a, a more, uh, not more feasible, just another feasible method, um, I think the way to go about is to really rely on mirrors to bring us uh, slowly to temperature equilibrium and hopefully then cool down. And hopefully as we cool down, we'll be able to you know, reestablish the temperature gradients uh, through uh, natural mechanisms in the earth uh, system. Uh, so it's not a... Um, something that we can hope to achieve linearly, that's a linear of the implementation of mirror, but that's something, uh, a roundout, roundabout trajectory that we have to first, you know, stop overheating, return to energy balance, and hopefully cool down a little bit and then let nature um, take, take over. Great. And uh, maybe there's also the secondary effect, you know, when we reduce the temperature at the equatorial regions, we actually, uh, reduce heat transport through atmosphere and ocean to the poles. And that could also cool the Arctic. So the exact um, result is not clear without uh, more detailed study and uh, uh, analysis, but it's not, not immediately clear that it would uh, be a net weakening effect, actually. All right. Let's wrap it up right there. Thank you very much, Dr. Tao. And thanks everybody for watching and joining in with your questions. We'll try, as I indicated, we'll try to expand on this information in a future recorded presentation without taking up all of your time, Dr. Tao. Because I know your time it's, is it's valuable. It's always a pleasure to, to join the discussion. Thank you very much. And again, thanks to everybody for joining in, for submitting your questions and so forth.